The American dream is alive and well because you started with $120,000. You right. each put $10,000, you got the rest right. And closing bill today, KKR, at a market cap of $57 billion. Well, you're going to be a good entrepreneur. What do you do? You're either going to get through the wall or you're going to get over the wall, but you're going to get to the other side somehow. Hey, Dr. Kravis, welcome to um, Guilford County and this event. These are all business people. I see three or four hyper-university business students here. They're all looking for jobs. So, <laughs> you know, you're... But they all want to start the vice president, you know, that's, that's sort of the I, idea. I, I don't blame them. <laughs> so, Henry Kravis, you were born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then you went to Claremont McKenna College in California. Then you went to Columbia to get your MBA. And then you got a job at um, Bern Stearns, in, um, and you were a partner by age 31. And then something happened you didn't like. Someone didn't like your idea. And you and your cousin George left and started KKR. What's that all about? What happened? Let us in on the secret. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we were at Bear Stearns, George Roberts, as you said, is my first cousin. He grew up in Houston. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, we had been, along with Jerry Kohlberg, Jerry was 19 years older than George and I. George and I were both 32 at the time we started the firm. And uh, we actually went to the senior partner at Bear Stearns, said to him, uh, we, you know we've been doing, we'll call it private equity now, it's, uh, it's had all different names. And uh, they hated it because they were a sales and trading firm. And for them, overnight was long term. They never put a penny into any deal we ever did. But they were happy to get the fees that we would bring in from that, but didn't invest. So we said, we want to do this, and we'd like to do it within Bear Stearns. We'll give you half of this new firm, we'll call it KKR, and we'll take half. And the senior partner, Cy Lewis, said, you're either here doing what we want you to do, or you're out. So we went back to our office, and we said, well, there's our answer, we're out. So we left. Now, George and I didn't have any money. We were young partners there, but that didn't mean anything. And so. Uh, I put up ten thousand dollars. That's all the money I had. George put up ten thousand. That's all he had. And Jerry was nineteen years older. He put up a hundred. So we started this firm with one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And the idea was, which was what we had been doing at Bear Stearns, was to make long-term investments. For Bear Stearns, <clears throat> five to ten years, that that was uh, unheard of. They didn't know what it meant. For them, long-term was overnight. They were a sales and trading firm. So we wanted to make long-term investments and improve businesses. That really was the point of the investment. And so we just bought a few companies, and um, including a company in, in Greensboro. Uh, Born Clay Products was one of our very first uh, investments. That was in 1974. We started making investments in 69. And um, we... Uh, uh, made a little money with that for, for uh, the firm. And so when we started, we went out to raise a $25 million fund. And we went to a man in Pittsburgh named Henry Hillman. Now, I had read an article that uh, Henry Hillman had put the money up to start uh, Kleiner Perkins, the venture capital firm, about four months before. So I called him, and I said, we'd like to come down. He said, great. He didn't know what we did, and I didn't, we didn't know each other. And so George and I went down to see him. And uh, we left after lunch. And he said, I'll be back to you in two weeks. So fine. That was sort of normal. We were dealing with a prudential insurance company, Mass Mutual. All took a long time. And he, um, five days go by, and his right-hand man, Wes Adams, uh, called me. He said, did you not like us? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, we haven't heard from you. It's five days since you were here. And I said, well, Mr. Adams, I thought that um, you uh, and, and Mr. Hillman said that uh, you'd be back to us in, uh, in two weeks. And he started laughing. He said, that's right. He said, that's what we said. But he said, the minute you and George walked out of the room, Mr. Hillman said, you know, I like those young guys. I want half their fund. 
So I did the Toyota Leap thinking I'm on a payphone at the O'Hare Airport thinking, wow, we're in business. Well, not so fast. You have to understand, we have left Bear Stearns. We had no money. We each had three kids. We're both 32 years old. And uh, we couldn't raise a $25 million fund on terms that made sense. I'll tell you what happened. So he was going to give us the first half of it, $12.5 million. We went to the Prudential and Mass Mutual. They said, we love you. You made us a lot of money. We'll take the other half, but. And the but was they wanted to be the investment committee. And George and I had had enough dealings with them that we didn't leave Bear Stearns to go to work for the Prudential. Now, I'm sorry if anybody in the audience is from the Prudential Insurance Company, but we did not want to work for the Prudential. So uh, we said, thank you very much. And there we are, uh, no money, no job, and no office, actually, at that point. And, well, you're going to be a good entrepreneur. What do you do? You're either going to get through the wall or you're going to get over the wall, but you're going to get to the other side somehow. And so we uh, went to dinner, and we had a, uh, we had a cocktail, and uh, we said, okay, we got a problem. We're out of a job, three kids each. Uh, what is it going to take to run uh, KKR? We had two offices. George was going to be in San Francisco. Jerry and I would be in New York. Held our finger in the air and said, $500,000. Okay. Let's go to eight individuals and ask them to put up $50,000 each. And if they put up the 50000 that's 400000 The other 100000 we figured we need, if we bought a company, we get a fee. And you, and, com- you committed them for five years, did you not? Yes, and we committed them for five years uh, at 50000 a year. And what we said to them is in return for that, we will give you the right to invest in any deal we have, deal by deal, but... Uh, and then if you come in, we said, okay, we've got to get part of the, uh, part, a part of the profit. Well, there was no such thing as carried interest in 1976. So we, all George and I knew was the oil and gas business because George's father was, a petrol, was a, uh, an independent oil and gas operator. My father was a petroleum engineer. And in the oil business in those days, uh, what was standard was called a third for a quarter. And that meant if I came to you, Nito, and said, uh, we're going to drill a well, you're gonna, if you have the money to put up, you, I'll put up 25% of the money if you'll put up 75% of the money. But in return for that, uh, we want a third for a quarter, which meant we wanted 33% of the profits for our 25% interest. So George and I knew that. That's all we knew. So we said, why don't we do that? We got partway into our dinner, and we said, well, that's all great, except we've got one problem. We don't have 25% of the money to put up. We have no money. So what are we going to do? We said, well, what does that sound like? So we picked 20% of the profits. Now, when I tell that story to private equity people or tell uh, venture capital hedge fund people, they always say the same thing. Why didn't you pick 25%? Easy for you to say, you know, we had no money, no job. We're just trying to get started. And there was no industry. I mean, there was no one doing what is called now called private equity. So that's, that's really how we got started. We started with 20%. So, so the interesting part to me is that the American dream is alive and well because you started with $120,000. You right. each put 10000 you got the rest of it. Right. And closing bill today, KKR at a market cap of $57 billion. That's right. I'm interested in knowing, and I suspect many people here are interested in knowing, what are the fundamentals that you look at? When you look at a company, what are the fundamentals? What are the one or two or three things that you look at that says to you, I think this is a great opportunity. I think we can make something of this. What are those fundamentals? Well, there's no set uh, thing. In fact, we had an investment committee meeting today, and... One of the things that's pretty standard uh, is, uh, what's the industry? And where does this company fit in the industry? Because if it's number seven in an industry, unless you have a pretty clear path to get it to one or two or three, it's pretty tough to, to do anything, unless it's a niche business. So what we're looking for is, what's the industry like? Is it the buggy whip business is going by the wayside, or is it a real growth business? So we look at that. We look at, and when we, management is key uh, whenever we buy a company. Now, uh, mistakes that we've made over the years is we waited too long 
to change out a bad management team. And I will say this, that pretty much what you see is what you're going to get when you first meet somebody. Uh, yeah, you can change them around the edges, but after you spend you know, a number of hours with them, you pretty much size up the person. And we used to make a lot of mistakes. So today, do we have somebody in mind who can be the CEO? If not, is there a big enough group of people that we could draw from that could come in and run it? So management is key. The industry, management, what's the pers where, where is it? And I'd say another thing that is very important is uh, our uh, risk factors. What somebody told me years ago, and I, 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 I've never forgotten it, if you always worry about what you can lose and never worry about how much you'll make, you'll always make money. And, it, and it's so true. Say, say that one more time, Henry. If you cap your downside, don't worry about how much money you're going to make on the upside, then you're going to probably always do well. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things we look at is what's the risk involved? Okay, if we're going to buy the company, what's the price we have to pay? Um, and by the way, I will say that we've never been, our mistakes we've made have not been because uh, we uh, paid, overpaid. Mistakes we made were big macro mistakes. We missed on gas prices. We didn't realize gas prices would go from 12 to 2 very quickly. We missed on when Toys R Us was a uh, big mistake for us. And uh, uh, we didn't pay enough attention to this little company called Amazon. And they came along and chewed our legs off. Um, and I can go down a long list and, and bore you what, what with the number of mistakes. What happened with Toys R Us? What, what, what mistake well, did you make? Toys R Us, the mistake that we made there, we bought the company. Uh, we put too much leverage on it, number one. Mm. They had no e-commerce. What's, what's too much leverage? 40%, 30%? No, 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 no. Look, 60%? Let, me, let, me, let me put it back into perspective. So in the 80s, when we would buy a company, like we bought Safeway. We paid $5.6 billion to buy Safeway, the supermarket chain. $5.6 billion. We put up $126 million to own 100% of the equity. And we borrowed $5.4 billion mm. in round numbers. Today, you can't do that because, one, prices are higher. You can't put that kind of leverage on, nor should you. So today, if we buy a company in today's market, you might pay, let's say you pay 12 times EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, you would put on uh, maybe four or five times debt, which means the rest of it has to come in the form of equity. Mm -hmm. So uh, the thing that we, the mistakes we made on Toys R Us, one, they, had, they did not have a good e-commerce program. And they were relying too much on Amazon to run it for them. And Amazon learned about the toy business from Toys R Us and then said goodbye. Mm. And there we were without anything, and they gave it to them. So that was a former management, but we inherited a contract we couldn't get out of. Um, they weren't innovative enough. You've got to be, if you're going to be in that business, you've got to keep changing. So one of the things that I always like to say, and I say it to students all the time, uh, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance a lot less. <laughs> and so if you can't change a business, I say it to our people at KKR all the time, you know, you've got to change. You've got to innovate. You've got to be willing to take risks. So in Toys R Us, mistake was e-commerce was a bigger part of the business than we thought. I mean, it was a smaller part of the business, but it's going to be a bigger part of the, of the industry. Um, bad management. Too many stores, bad product. So, for example, when you checked out, I'll tell you how bad it was. When we bought it, you checked out. And if you had electronic products with dolls and, and other things, you had to go through one line for the electronics and one line for, you know, dolls and, 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 and bikes or whatever. That's crazy. So we finally got the right management. But by that time, it was too late. Mm. And so a uh, mistake that was made there um, was, uh, and I'll tell you something, as I'm thinking about it, we had a, um, 
a mem the team came to the investment committee with a memo that was about as from the floor up to here. And I said, first of all, I don't, I'm not going to read all this stuff. If you can't explain this to us in five or six pages, maybe you've got a real problem. Well, they couldn't. But we went ahead anyway, and it was the number one toy retailer in the, in the, in the world, and so a uh, mistake was made. Yeah. Um, you talk about your first entree into North Carolina. I think it was your first. was Born Brick, right, yes. in this neighborhood. And then I think everybody in the room is quite aware of um, your acquisition of um, RJR. And um, we've, you know, this has been a very, very public thing. We've read books about it and the media talked about it. Um, let us in a little bit now that time has passed. What is your take on that acquisition? And um, what fascinated me is in the same year you made that acquisition, RGR was the 19th largest company in the United States. 19th largest. I think you paid for $25 billion. 30. 30 billion dollars. Well, I just, billion. Let's, let's not pick on the details here. Just <laughs> find out. And, and um, Henry, in the same year, you also bought Duracell and you bought Stop and Shop grocery chain. Right. That's a lot to do in one year? Or was that the norm for you? Well, keep in mind um, uh, that um, it was over. Actually, we bought uh, within a, about a two-year period. You're right. Um, there was a lot of money available then. Uh, uh, you could leverage a company very, very much. For example, in RJR, okay. We had been talking to the management of RJR and Abisco about putting it together with Beatrice. Beatrice Foods was a company that we had owned based in Chicago, and we'd been after Beatrice for a long time because it was one of the worst-run companies that, uh, that I'd seen. And George and I kept saying, God, if we could only buy that, and the management would never talk to us. And one day, um, uh, we get a call uh, that they just fired the CEO of Beatrice. I said, well, let's dust off our numbers and, and see what we can do. Now, I'm going to lead up to, to our chair in a minute. And so um, we did, and we said, this would be great. I called the banker, and uh, I said uh, to him, uh, his name was Ira Harris, and uh, it was at Solomon Brothers at the time in Chicago, and I said, we'd like to buy Beatrice Foods. I think he'd say, you've got to be kidding me. Hmm. And uh, he said, well, if you have anything to say, put it in writing. Now, today, you probably couldn't do this. I called my secretary and I dictated a letter, said, we'd like to buy the company. Here's the price, roughly, that we would pay. And I sent it off, figuring, well, nothing's going to happen or the lawyer's going to call back. Not at all. He called back two days later. He said, we want to come see you. So he and the interim CEO came to meet with me. And long story short, we ended up buying Beatrice for about $8.6 billion. After we bought Beatrice, we then uh, thought about combining it with RJR and Nabisco. And we'd had a number of conversations with Ross Johnson. And Ross got the idea, geez, maybe I could buy the company. And... Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Henry and, and uh, uh, the CEO at Beatrice give me a really good idea. So he went off and uh, talked to a couple good friends of his, and they put an offer in at $70 a share. Well, we looked at it, George and I looked and said, this is crazy. This company is worth over $100 a share. They're stealing the company. And so uh, that was on a Friday. We worked all weekend. And on Monday afternoon, we sent a letter in at $90 a share. And, uh, well, that started the, the bidding uh, uh, contest. And so what we saw in it was a very poorly managed business. Uh, we saw a business that had incredible potential. We were worried about the tobacco business because that was a part of it. But that was the cash machine, cash flow machine. But we were worried about that, what happens to it in the future. And at the time, we thought they can last long enough. It's not going to be a real problem. And so um, we, 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 send, uh, we send the letter in. And the next thing you know, they come back a week later with a $95. And so we're going back and forth. Well, just give you an example of the waste that was in that company. Um, so I get a call one day from our lawyer. And uh, Dick Beatty, and he said, uh, do you know 
uh, one of the senior executives at RJR by the name of G. Shepard. I said, I don't know any G. Shepard. And he started laughing, and I said, what are you laughing about? He said, well, that is Ross Johnson's German Shepherd, and that German Shepherd flies on the, one of their 11 airplanes uh, by himself. So whenever Ross Johnson wanted to get uh, his dog out to visit with him, uh, he'd send the plane for him. That was the tip of the iceberg, you know. I mean, there was just waste everywhere. First of all, what, what company has 11 airplanes? Uh, they had 11 airplanes. <clears throat> and so we just saw where we could run the business so much better than it had been run. We were lucky enough to uh, be able to attract a guy named Lou Gerstner, who was the president of American Express, to come and be our CEO. And, you know, we went to work and fix improving the business. Mm. And so we go through all of this, and in the end, it was a lousy investment. Yeah, we fixed a lot of it. Uh, uh, we wanted, after, uh, after about four years, we were going to split the company into two. We were going to go with the tobacco business as one separate business and the food business, the Nabisco business, as a separate business. But we had to wait five years to do it. Otherwise, there was a big tax uh, splitting the company apart. After five years, we could have done it. And then we were worried because then a couple of investigations started on the tobacco industry uh, in general, and we knew we'd be dragged into that as well. So we couldn't split it apart. And um, uh, honestly, the bottom line of RJR and Nabisco, uh, we made a little money, but not a lot. Uh, it got more publicity than it probably should have. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to Washington and meet one-on-one -on -one with 33 senators to talk to them about, uh, you know, what this was, what we were doing, and the House Ways and Means Committee. They wrote a book about it called Barbarians of the Gate, and here we are, I don't know, 30, uh, 33 years later or something. And uh, they're finally, uh, we're finally getting rid of that uh, name, Barbarians at the Gate. So in, in short, it was not a great investment. It was a great experience. They made a movie out of it, which was lousy. I don't know. I didn't, if any of you saw it, I, I have yet to see the whole movie. I've fallen asleep twice trying to watch it. <laughs> but don't feel badly. My wife, Mary Jose, who, who's here, she'll tell you I fall asleep at all the movies, so it doesn't matter. But uh, that is, is no, you know, it didn't depict what really happened. The book, on the other hand, if you haven't read it, it's an interesting read. And I would say it's about 85% accurate. Mm. The quotes aren't, but the story and what happened, actually I learned a little from the book about what the other side was doing, which I didn't know exactly what they were doing. And it was craziness during this time because it was this fever of we've got to win. And we were in the same mode as Ross Johnson and his team. And Ross had teamed up uh, with um, Shearson Lehman Brothers and... Uh, uh, they had uh, uh, Jim Robinson from American Express was helping them and so forth. And uh, it was sort of crazy. It was a crazy time when you think about back on, on this. And, and I'm often asked, would you do it again? Yeah, I'd probably do it again, but do it differently. Mm. Why do you have a sign in your office that uh, says arrogance kills? Have you been in my office? <laughs> When you were out of town, I yeah. was there twice. Well, let me tell you, Nito, it's exactly right. That sign, um, my long-serving assistant had it made for me and framed one Christmas because she said she'd heard me say that so many times. And I just don't believe anybody should be arrogant. I don't care who you are. You know, we all get dressed the same way and, you know, all given equal opportunities to a degree. And I just don't believe in arrogance. And I've seen more companies and more institutions and more people um, fall apart because being arrogant. Mm. And that's why I have it there. And I talk about it a lot. You talk a lot about corporate culture. Yes. What is, in your view, is the, if not ideal, a highly effective corporate culture? Well, it's an in interesting question. When Jerry George and I started KKR, uh, we had two conversations back to back. The first conversation was uh, how we can split the economics. 
that took about a minute and a half. Jerry, you're putting up $100,000. You're 19 years older than George and I. We're putting up 10 each. Uh, why don't you take 40% and we'll take 30 And then the first 10 points that we give up, uh, that to get, is given up, will come from you. We're e- even, then we'll come down to go. No problem. Second conversation took not much longer. It's probably the most important conversation that we ever had. And that was... Uh, what kind of culture do we want to have at KKR? Now, we came out of Bear Stearns, which was an eat-what-you-kill culture. It was a culture where everybody raised their hand and said, I did this, I did that. Now, Nita, if I brought you in to the partner's dining room, uh, and I went back there about five, uh, you know, six months later, you might be in there with another partner, and I wouldn't even know it Hmm. because everybody was trying to just get whatever they could grab. And everybody was running around the firm, and I did this, I did that. We didn't want that. We wanted a we firm, not an I firm. We wanted a firm where everybody participated, whether you were a partner at the firm or you were not a partner, whether you worked on a deal or you didn't. And keep in mind that we started out uh, with just private equity. That's all we did, and, and just in the U.S. And so we said, that's what we want. And today... Here we are 47 years later. We had our uh, birthday yesterday, uh, and it's exactly the same culture. That is our DNA today. It is the most important thing. I tell uh, young companies when they say, what piece of advice would you give me? I said, have a culture. Whatever culture you have, talk about it constantly. I'm not going to tell you what's the right culture for you, but I'll tell you what's the right culture for us. And... You can't talk about it enough. Don't forget, you're bringing in new people from time to time or all the time. They don't know your culture. Mm -hmm. When you hire, we spend a lot of time on, uh, when we're hiring people, uh, trying to see how will they fit in the culture. So one of the things that's very important for senior people, we may have as many as 25 interviews for that person. Now, all of you say, geez, that's a lot. And it is. There's a reason. We want enough people in the firm to say, we want that person to come into the firm. We think they'll fit in the culture. Uh, And they come in with 25 supporters on day one, 20, 25. Yes, I could hire anybody we want, but that's doing a disservice to that person. We're looking for signs of, uh, are they an I person or are they a we person? Are they a team player? If we're interviewing a CEO, for example, for a job, what I'm looking for is uh, how many times did he talk about his team or she talk about her team? Did they only talk about themselves? I did this and I did that. Well, you know what it's like. You run a huge university and very well. There's no way that any of us can do it by ourselves. I don't care who we are. And so we're always looking for people that want to be part of a team. And, and so when we review people at the end of each year, we review them in four areas. One area, and no particular importance, I mean, uh, ranking. One is management and leadership. These are particularly our top people. Management, leadership, commercial success, uh, culture and values. Are they living by our culture and values? We have a lot of, we've had people at the firm that did exceptionally uh, well as far as making us money and we fired them because they didn't go to any meetings, they wouldn't help anybody else at the firm, and you'll kill a firm, in my view, if you do that. So that, and then the fourth area is uh, diversity and inclusion. Very important part is we're trying to uh, make sure that we have not only uh, diversity in in gender, ethnicity, but we want diversity in thought. We want different people all the time. Too many young people want to hire people like themselves. And I think it's a big mistake. You want people with different views, different perspectives. Now, I have to say, and I give Mary Jose a lot of credit for this, she kept after me, well, you don't have enough women uh, in the the ranks at KK, in the senior ranks. And she was 100% right. In fact, Wall Street didn't. All of Wall Street, and certainly the private equity industry didn't. And so George and I made up our mind that we're going to really have a, a, a push on this. And so we're making progress. We're not to where we want to be yet, but we have 38% of our executives today are women. We have a big push on um, ethnicity. 
And, uh, you know, that's really important to us. Now, we've gone from three people to today we've got 2,500 people. We have 25 offices around the world. We have about five, a little over $500 billion of assets under management. And as you said, we have a $57 billion uh, market cap. The DNA of that, as I said, and I can't emphasize it enough, is the, is the culture. Mm. It's the culture and values, like you have here. This is exactly, what do you stand for? Mm -hmm. And when we hire people, one of the things we'll do, for example, with, with uh, senior people, we're going to hire somebody very senior. We want to take them and their partner out to dinner. Why? It's one thing sitting across the table from just one person. I want to see how they treat people. How do they treat the waiter? How do they treat other people there? How do they treat their partner? Uh, are they arrogant? Uh, is it all about them? Mm -hmm. They come in and they just sit down and don't care about anybody else? That's not going to work. We, we call that sort of the, uh, the door test. Did they open the door for somebody else? Mm. And so forth. Henry, I love hearing you say that. It's exactly what we teach in this university. I got to tell you a little story. This guy was trying to hire these two young guys just coming out of college. He did exactly what you just said. He took them out to dinner. At the end of the dinner, didn't look at a resume, didn't look at anything. They're just looking at these guys. At the end of the dinner, looked at one guy said, you're hired. Looked at the other guy said, go home. We don't need you. The guy to whom he said, go home, said, what? You didn't even ask me any questions. I'm very capable. I'm a... Uh, you know, terrific graduate from a great school. He said, no, I know everything I need to know about you. You made two things tonight that let me know you're not going to work in our firm. Number one, you never said please, you never said thank you to the server. Just what you just said. Yep. And listen to what you just said. What a basic concept. Right. Number two, he said, when the food came in, you put salt on your food before ever tasting it. I can't have someone working with me who makes a decision before getting all the facts. Yep. Life skills. Life skills. All right, so, so in the time we've got, I've got so much stuff I've got to ask you. Um, first of all, just, a, just one, one two words answer. Before it was private equity, it was LBOs, leverage buyout. Before that, what was it? Well, when we first started, we called it bootstrap acquisitions. Bootstrap, man, we didn't have any equity, so you put up a dollar and you could borrow $50 of debt. So as I said in Safeway, uh, you know, we put up $126 million of equity against a $5.6 billion, you know, total purchase price. All the rest was down. And today many people refer to you as the king of private equity. That's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted them to refer to you as the emperor? Barbarian. <laughs> uh, actually, <laughs> Barbarian's funny. Um, it, it, too bad, but one time, Mary Jose and I were in uh, Germany and at the Bilderberg meeting, and the chancellor at the, at the time of Germany came to be the dinner speaker, and he started referring to people like us as locusts. And he was a friend of mine, and I went up to him afterward. I said, is that better or is that worse than barbarian, number one? And why do you, why do, you do that? He said, I'm just trying to get elected. <laughs> so, anyway. So, um, Henry, you've served on many, many boards, including Safeway, um, uh, Owens Corning, um, uh, AutoNation, my friend Wayne Heisegger that I've had a lot of respect for. Um, and now you're, you're paying a lot of attention to tech companies, and am I right on that, investing in a lot of tech companies? Well, personally, uh, I've been investing in venture and startups since 1998, and I could do it because KKR never invested in venture. We were always, you know, established uh, companies, uh, very profitable, et cetera. So I do a lot of investing both in tech and, uh, and other things. I love it because I learn from young people. Mm. I, uh, you know, for me, it's exciting. Mm. And they challenge me constantly. See, I have a belief that unless you're curious, you can't be a good investor. So if I took somebody to the window at KKR, and we're, my office is on the 77th floor in New York, and if I take them to the window and I did a test, I said, what do you see out there? They said, that's a trick question. Let's see. Uh, I see the tugboat in the Hudson River. You failed. Hmm. I want you to see everything. 
I want you to see opportunity. I want you to see possibilities. And that's the way I've always thought, you know. And by the way, I say, there are no dumb ideas. They're just some ideas that are better than others. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with failing. Failing, actually, I'm hoping you will fail and you learn from it and you're going to be better the next time. But I find more and more young people today are really reticent to take risk. They're, they're afraid of failing. They probably get straight A's and they've done really well and they can answer every test exam because it's, most of it's multiple choice these days. And, uh, but they don't know how to take risk. They also don't know what's really important. Like we talked about, what's important in, if we're going to make an investment? Don't tell me how many blue trucks there are. It doesn't matter how many blue trucks. Tell me what's going to, what we can do today to make this company a better business going forward. So technology is a very important part of this how do you make a business better? Uh, there's, no company, there's no company today that doesn't use technology. And you have to put technology at the beginning of the parade. And for many, many years, it was at the end of the parade. And it was, oh, yeah, the, the guy that does the, the IT stuff, we'll, we'll see if he can fix our video. No, no. Make them right there at the beginning, sit side by side with you, and let them understand what are you trying to accomplish. So two, uh, two people who've had great technology um, experience. One of them is Steve Wozniak, who is the co-founder of Apple. He's in residence here. He teaches our students every yeah. semester. The other one is Mark Randolph, the co-founder of uh, Netflix. Changed the way we watch television. Uh, I asked Steve uh, Wozniak one time this question. Everybody wants to talk about AI, 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 uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and what do you think of it? He said, it's great. It's going to change the world. Uh, however, he said, there's no such thing as artificial wisdom. <laughs> you, you speak from wisdom. And I believe that college students today and young entrepreneurs and young business enterprisers ought to hear wisdom. The wisdom that came from some failings. That you just admitted, you know, Toys R Us, we made a mistake for this reason and that reason. Let, let's talk about something else. World affairs. When you look at our world today, geopolitically, what is it you see? What is it that scares you? What is it that, that gives you hope about the future? So much is going all over the place. We hear about it from all corners. We read about it endlessly. Is Henry Kravis today saying that our world is in danger because of A, B, or C, or are you saying, no, no, I think we're on track because of A, B, or C? There is never A, B, or C, and there's never everything's going straight up, in my view. Um, uh, if you ask, what is my biggest concern? My biggest concern is what you teach here and what, you te what other schools teach. Our education system in general has declined. Uh, particularly in the in the elementary and high school level, and I worry about that. Our colleges are pretty good, but getting there, and you know how many students you bring here that aren't ready for college, and yet they should be. Um, I'm chairman of SCO. We talked about uh, in the introduction, and we do a diagnostic test when we uh, do the. Um, bring kids in. And so how many kids uh, have a 90 or above in the public schools where you are? And all these hands go up and so forth. I said, well, look, why don't you forget about that 90? We're going to give you a standardized uh, diagnostic test to see where you really are and where you should be in ninth grade. That 90 and above is 55. So that means every kid today in the New York and the San Francisco school systems, which are our two areas right now before we're here, in Guilford County, are failing. What's my biggest concern? It's exactly that. I worry about what does that mean, what they're teaching. They're teaching all sorts of stuff, but they forgot to teach history. They're not teaching English. Uh, and as you said, the, the, the wisdom uh, side of it. And, and but is that true all over the world? I mean, in China, India, 
They're teaching a lot of things, right? They're trying to eat our breakfast and lunch every day. There are more, there are more people in China learning English as a second language than there are native English speakers in the entire world. That's exactly right. And so I worry about that because we're, we're worried about things that, honestly, I don't think, uh, yeah, they're important, but they're not as important as understanding our history in America, and understanding the world and how it relates to it. Uh, I wish colleges did more um, uh, like they do in the UK and do in France. At the end of your four years, you have a comprehensive exams that you have to take. Mm. Too many students today learn to take the test. Mm. They learn to pass the course, mm. but then they forget it because they cram for it. Today, I worry about that. So if we lose our education and the quality of education that we have in America, we have a chance of moving toward losing our democracy. And that's a big statement, but I'm worried about that. So if you say, what am I worried about? Look at the number of countries where democracy is declining in one way or another. And I worry that we stand a chance, if we're not careful in this country, of diminishing the, the, uh, our democracy. Now, having said that, what we need in the country, in my view, is leadership. We need real leadership, somebody that doesn't care, Republican or Democrat. The problem is today, nobody talks to each other. You know, you know what it's like being a college president, how many times you have somebody come on and, and, and you see it on college campuses, and if they're too far to the right or too far to the left, oh, we don't want them here, we don't want them here. I want everybody, okay? Well, we went to college uh, uh, to learn, to learn other, from other people. So I worry about that, that freedom, that ability to learn, not just I only want to be with people like myself. So I worry about that too. We're not learning enough from each other. Am I worried about China? Of course, you've got to be worried about China. Having said that, I don't think we're communicating with China. We should be communicating with the Chinese leadership. Our government should be communicating and keep talking. They're not going away and we're not going away. And the less we talk to each other, the more danger we have of something bad happening, in my view. So I worry, I worry about that. I can go on. Having said the worry side, this is the greatest country in the world. This country has, so far, if we don't lose it, and that's what I'm talking about there, we have today more opportunity than anywhere in the world. And you just have to uh, take advantage of it. I like to say to young people, take one sentence out of your vocabulary. And that is, I wish I had. Don't ever look back and say, God, I wish I had talked to that person, or I wish I had tried that, even if I failed. I wish I had tried it. And too many times, people look back and say, I wish I had and I didn't do it and I missed a real opportunity. Let me tell you students one thing. There is no perfect job when you come out of college unless you are really lucky. I, too many times, young people say to me, I said, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm looking for the perfect job. I said, well, you're gonna be looking a long time unless you get really lucky because there isn't that perfect job. Just get into the workforce, and you never can tell. Open your mind and say, I'm willing to try a lot of different things. Because you never can tell. You may be on a plane going somewhere, and, and you're sitting next to somebody who's the CEO of a company, and you start talking. You say, geez, you sound really true. I'd love to have you come interview. Well, you didn't think you'd ever go to that company. I'd also tell you, go live in another country and learn what another country's like. Too many people say, no, I only want to stay in my neighborhood you're missing a real opportunity because the world is not your, your neighborhood, I promise you that. And I can go on and on. You have no idea, we've got a couple of High Point people here, you have no idea. You're describing High Point University. Experiential learning, global education, we give it free, tuition free, because we want you to go and, and see the world and learn from the world. We even have a cross section of a, an airplane on campus. We teach you how to sit down, talk to the guy next to you, ask the right question. Listen, Henry, um, you've got to be concerned about economics. You've got to be concerned that the second major bank in this country just failed. 
Now, you've got to be concerned about the fact that inflation has gone up to a high level. You've got to be concerned about the fact we've just gone through COVID and supply chain almost brought us to our knees. The reason I haven't mentioned the economy, because it's transitional. Uh, I've always been a believer what goes up comes down and what's down will go back up. When you went through the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, None of us had ever been through anything like that. And I've been doing investing since for 54 years. And I, um, I thought, well, what can I tell people that, that is going to keep them calm? And I said, focus on what you can control. There's noise in the system. Mm. And you'll read stuff. You're going to hear stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But there's not a darn thing you can do about it. But focus on the company where you're involved. Can you help them cut costs? Can you refinance the debt as soon as the debt markets open up and so forth? We got through that just fine. And I don't, if you want to know, okay, where are you on the economy right now? Well, I'll tell you where I am on the economy. I think we will have a, a recession. You can't have interest rates continuing to go up. And right now they're just under 5%, the Fed, Fed funds rate. They'll go to a little over five, in my view, this week uh, when the Fed meets, and I guess they'll do another quarter. Um, four out of five times since the 1970s, uh, when interest rates got above 5%, you had a recession. So, uh, what, but what's surprising right now is the country, uh, the economy in the U.S., and in Europe for that matter, is as resilient as it is. Um, I think people are still working off uh, savings that they had. I will be the first to say I think our government, both Republican and Democrat side, did the wrong thing in paying people base during COVID. They should have given money to the com companies to keep people employed. What happened is people dropped out. They did. They started. They lost their skills of showing up in the morning, working, and so forth. And many people, by the way, earn more money not working than than working. I think it's a big mistake. Uh, in France, for example, they basically gave the money to the companies to keep the people employed, and, and it worked. So today, we have a lot of people that have dropped out of the workforce. We had about 62 percent uh, participation rate or so. Um, but what's happened today? Where are we? So you've got a uh, – the capital markets have basically dried up. Uh, IPOs, bond offerings – uh, and the like used to be running normal at about 8% of GDP. Right now, they're 1.4% of GDP, which means nothing much is happening in the capital markets. Market, uh, the stock market in general is down 25% in, in for, most, for most companies. And when you start to get under 25%, the history has shown since the 1970s that you've had a rebound in the first year when you come out of a recession uh, of about a 19% increase in, in markets. For three years, it's about a 10% increase. For five years, it's about the same. So uh, yeah, I look at this as opportunity, but we're not there yet because I'm surprised, honestly, that the stock market is as high as it is right now, given that I, I, here's what I feel like. I feel like I'm on the beach. Bright sun, the, 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 the sea is as calm as can be. And, and I read, though, that there's a tsunami coming. You've got to be kidding. There's no tsunami. Look at how nice it is. That's sort of what I feel like right now. I don't feel yet that we're into where we're going to be. But I, we think, and I think the same, that in the end of this year we'll have a, a recession. I'm not calling for a deep recession. I'm calling for a recession. And into early next year, we're calling for this year about a one and a half percent GDP growth for the for the year. Your first quarter was, I think, one one. Um, probably a slowdown uh, next year, even lower. A half of one percent to one percent growth is what we're, we're we think it'll be. But more importantly, we think margins in companies will decline, um, and so we're. Because you can't have inflation like it is. You can pass it on for a little bit, but at some point, the consumer and, and, and the customer, whether it's business uh, to business or business to consumer, they say, no mas, okay? We're just not going to pay that. And so then 
somebody has to absorb that if they're going to sell it, and that's the company. So we see margins being squeezed uh, over the next uh, 12 uh, plus months. But we're going to come out of all this. So there'll be a time to really lean in. And we've made our best investments when we lean in. I think inflation is going to stay high for a while. I think growth is going to stay low for a while. But there'll be a time when we feel, okay, let's really lean in. Now, having said that, there are always going to be opportunities. Companies, you say, that's a great company. And yes, we're probably paying more than we should today, but we'll never buy it otherwise. And we will lean in and, and buy that. Well, um, hope is eternal, I think, is what you're saying. Don't yeah. give up. Well, but not, but not that. Look at history. You know, I don't expect the world to come to an end. I expect China to continue to be strong. But by the way, China's got lots of problems. You know, China is not a panacea by any stretch. They're coming out of their uh, COVID lockdown, which was horrible, and they'll probably grow five or five and a half percent this year, okay? But, you know, starting from lower levels, and um, they'll do fine. And that's one of the reasons I think we'll get through this as their growth continues. We'll benefit from that to a degree. Europe is better today than I would have expected it to be. Gas prices are lower because they had a warmer winter. So they were able to store, didn't have to pay as much for gas. That was actually helpful. So, you know, you got a little growth uh, in Europe. It's never been high growth, but you, you still have growth there. So, you know, you got to look everywhere for opportunities. If you had asked me, you know, it said, asked me five or ten years ago, do you think you'll ever buy a company in Vietnam, in Ethiopia, in Serbia? Uh, Turkey. I said, Are you crazy? Turkey. 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 Na name it. I'd say crazy. Well, we bought companies in every one of those because you're always going to find some opportunity somewhere uh, to, uh, to invest in. I'm curious for a, a leader as busy as you are, as intelligent as you are, as invested as you have been. Um, why and how did you become so interested in SEO? SEO is a nonprofit. Uh, your history has been, while well, you've been very philanthropic, and there's evidence of this everywhere. In fact, the Carnegie Foundation gave you the Medal of Philanthropy. Um, this is just good work for the good future of America in educating young people, ensuring that they too will have an opportunity. Why is it that Henry Kravis, at this stage in your life and for the last um, 10 years in SEO, You've given so much interest. Why are you here tonight to talk about, I forced you to talk about other subjects, but really you want to talk about SEO and how it benefits students. Tell me, tell me where you find that time and what is it that drives you so passionately about it? Well, first of all, anybody that says, gee, I just don't have the time to do it, you find the time. You make the time because I think that's a lame excuse. Years ago when I was in my 40s, I, I called David Rockefeller. David was one of the greatest philanthropists around. And I said, David, would you have lunch with me? And he said, yes. And I said, you know, I'm just starting to make a little money. And could I ask you how I can best go about it? And he said, I'm not going to tell you where to, uh, to spend your time or which charity you should get involved with. I'm going to only tell you one thing, that whatever you do, get involved. Don't just write a check. And I always remembered that. And so I was lucky enough to have been uh, involved in a number of things. And I um, have always been the kind that I either like to start something or take on a challenge where I think I can really grow it. And so I'd never heard of SEO in, in 2007 or eight, something like that. And one of my partners came to me and he said, um, we have a chance to uh, sponsor and, and really kick off a program and for uh, SEO for uh, the alternative investment uh, area. And I said, SEO, that's search engine optimization. And he <laughs> said, no, no, it's sponsors for educational opportunity. So I said, okay, uh, let me meet William Goodlow. Who's, who's here tonight. 
And I met William, and that's all I needed to know. William, and I will say it, I say it every time I get a chance, is one of the best CEOs of a not-for-profit that I've ever had a chance to work with. And so um, I said, yeah, we'll kick this off and be one of the two, uh, along with TPG, we'll kick it off. So next thing I know, uh, same partner comes to me and he said, they'd like to have you chair their gala. I said, I want to chair a, a, a gala. I, you know, I do that a lot. I, I really don't know this organization. And he said, I think you should do it. So I got talked into it and I, I, go, I go call William and I said, William, uh, what's the most you've ever raised for one of these benefits? And he said, $700,000. And I said, I don't mean to sound, you know, cheeky about this, but I said, uh, in New York, you know, if you don't raise a million dollars, it's hardly worth going out for dinner. And there's so many charity events every night. So I said, all right, that's a challenge. I'm going to do it. So we got lucky. We raised a million, too. But I heard these kids that were up there, the scholars. And this program, the SEO program, is a program of taking kids in the ninth grade uh, through college. It's one of the only programs around. It's an eight-year program. And we're not looking for the brightest kids. We're looking for uh, minority students who come from basic household income of somewhere under $40,000 and who really want the chance to go to college. And so, and we're also looking for that student who will probably be the first in that family to go to college. So I heard these students, and there were four students, talking about their life, talking about where they come from, the hardships that they faced, and what they were now able to do. Two of them were in college already, and two were still in high school wanting to go to college. So that got me really fired up. I said, wow, there are lots of programs around that get you into college but don't pay any attention to you after you're in. And so I started looking into this more, and William and I talked a lot about it, and I said, so tell me, in New York, how many kids are you taking in the ninth grade? Well, in New York, we're taking 125 students. As I had studied the program, I said, the program's too good to be taking only 125 students. And so, uh, when they asked me to be chairman, I said, well, William, the first thing I want to do, I want to double the number of students to, from 125 students in New York to 250. He said, well, that's going to cost a lot of money. I said, I got it. Don't worry. We'll raise it. And so, uh, and so he said, okay. The next thing I know, William and I are talking. He said, would you consider becoming chairman? Now, I've gone from a gala, which I didn't want to do, well, the alternative investment program, then to a gala, and then they honor me for the 50th anniversary, and then and I wasn't even on the board. And I thought, okay, that's fine. And the next thing I know, they said, would you become chairman? And I've now been chairman for nine years. It's the best program I've ever uh, experienced. Let me tell you where we are. So we went from 125 students, we take about 270 a year in ninth grade in New York. We're also in San Francisco where we take about 125 students a year in ninth grade, ninth grade through college. Um, they come in, they get that uh, diagnostic test that I mentioned earlier. They're all failing, but we're gonna get you to 90 or above. And we're also gonna get you into college and we're gonna get you through college. And you get through the high school part, you're only halfway there. So um, the thing that we uh, try to do is, okay, 100% of our kids that get through. Now, I don't know how many of you in this room, if your child came home and said, hey, mom or dad, I got in this great program and I'm going to go to school 40 Saturdays a year from 8.45 in the morning to 430 and I'm going to go the month of July, five days a week, 8.45 to 4.30. Well, I know if any of my kids had come home and said that I'd take them to the psychiatrist thinking they'd fallen out of bed and hit their head. Because what kid wants to do something on a Saturday particularly? And so 
But that's not the case. These are determined kids. We get 90 plus percent of our kids that go through the high school part. We lose about 10 percent along the way. 100 percent of those kids that get through the high school part get into college. Two thirds of them are in tier one colleges. And 90 percent of our kids graduate in six years. Almost all of them get a scholarship. May I inject one thought there? Yeah. That 90 percent compares with 23 percent exactly. national average That's right. six-year graduation for students who come from those backgrounds. Absolutely. That's exactly right. We score higher on the SAT than the national average than anybody in any uh, uh, socioeconomic tier and because we're working with them. These kids, and, and probably, if they're lucky, they'll have one parent, because the average is about two, two-thirds of these kids have one parent, and there's nobody to help them at home. We basically become that support system for them. So when I became the chair, and I was sitting around talking to our executive committee, and I looked around, and everyone was a minority, and I said, are you sure you want me? I'm not an SEO grad. I didn't go through the career program. Career program, by the way, is a program where uh, we're going to college campuses, over 100 of them. And if you have a B average or better and you're a minority, we will uh, interview you. If you pass the interview, we give you 12 online courses. You pass those, we will send your resume out to uh, companies and get you a summer job. And today, we're just under uh, uh, about 900 uh, jobs that we get during the summer for these kids. And 93% of these kids last year got full-time offers. These are paid jobs. These are paying the jobs summer. for the summer. So we get that. But then we have the scholars part, which is different. That's ninth grade through college. And that graduation rate's incredible. Now, I always ask the same question to these students when either we're, they're over at our house for a cocktail party raising some money or they come into our board. How many times did you think of dropping out? Every student said, well, many times. Mm -hmm. I said, why didn't you drop out? Who wants to go to school on Saturday? Now, I thought they were going to say my mother wouldn't let me or my teacher wouldn't let me. Not at all. I didn't drop out because of peer pressure, 100% peer pressure. We all, even though we're at different schools, we, we bind together on these Saturdays. And we're in it together, and we're going to pull each other along, and we're going to get through the program. Now, when I spoke to the uh, uh, executive committee, one of the things I did right away, I said, well, buckle up. We're going to go fast. I want to take this thing nationally. Now, I didn't have a complete understanding of how labor intensive it was. This is nine years ago. And I learned from San Francisco that it is really labor intensive. So during COVID, we, had, we were forced to go online. There's three things we had to get the kids. One, you had to get them a computer. That was easy. Two, you had to make sure they had Wi-Fi. We got them that. And three, you had to get them a place to, where they could work. That was the hard part. You couldn't do that because they're in small apartments in New York or small houses. And so, but we got through and we did just fine. But it gave us the idea that we could go national, that, that the dream that I had of taking it national, we could do it if we did it online. Now, my dear friend, Bobby Long, I had talked his ear off over the years about SEO and told him how great it was. And I told him, I said, you know, we've got this ability now, we think, to do it online. We've got a consulting firm in, and we think we can do it online. And Bobby says, I want to be the first uh, county to do it, Guilford County. And uh, I said, are you sure, Bobby? It's a, it's a lot of money. He said, we're going to get it done. He said, this is exactly what we need for Guilford County. It's exactly what we need. We're losing employment here. We're losing uh, the ability to keep the young kids uh, uh, involved and so forth. And so it is really Bobby uh, very much that, that uh, got behind this. And that's why we're here where we yeah. are today. And 
we're kicking this off. We, we, I mean, we have kicked it off in March, our first class. It's not big, but that's the way San Francisco was. San Francisco had about 10 or 15 students the first year. They're, they've got close to 125, 140. Uh, this will grow, and I'm excited about it. Yeah. Well, just, just know that um, Bobby does a lot of things like that. Bobby has, knows how to bring people together, like you have, uh, for the good cause, and then we move onward and forward. It's all about choices we make and the leaders we choose to work with. So, uh, Henry, let me, let me ask you. We, our time has run out. You've been very patient with me, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you, ladies and gentlemen, being here and listening attentively to, uh, I hope, what is, uh, uh, for many, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be in the presence of a person who has done it over and over and over again with great success. Henry, uh, finish this sentence for me. If I could live my life over again, I would change. If I live my life over again, I probably would have educated my kids differently. My kids were given every opportunity. My son went to Duke and Brown. My daughter went to Harvard. But I would have pushed them harder, mm. quite frankly. You're saying you would have sent them to High Point University. Is that your point? <laughs> you know, yeah. there's not... You would have been happier with their outcomes. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot to that. No, no, I'm serious. <laughs> yes. You know, I didn't know much about High Point University until I started seeing your ads uh, in the morning. I thought they're fantastic. And you and I have talked a little bit about that. I thought it was fantastic. No, I would have really pushed them more to do more things with the opportunities mm. they were given. Mm. And you know, oftentimes I say, and I love them, and they're, they're wonderful children, and they've uh, given Mary, Jose, and me six wonderful grandchildren. And, uh, How old are they, the grandchildren? They, they, they go from four to 16. Mm. And uh, so I've been blessed in many, many ways. But you know, oftentimes I wonder if Children who come from parents, and it's hard, parents who've been successful. I wonder if they wouldn't be better off if they didn't have that burden. Mm. Mm. I call it a burden because yeah. I think in many ways it is a burden. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I often say many kids, thank God dad was born first. And uh, because, you know, he gave him a lot or she gave him a lot, mother gave him a lot. And uh, unfortunately, they don't take advantage of it. Yeah. I thank God every day for the adversity I had in my life. Yeah. Learned a lot from it. That's the best thing. If you ask me today, here's your choice. Can you, um, you have a choice of picking students in the top 1% from name your university, non-Ivy League, non-Stanford, uh, what would you do? I'd said I'd go pick people from High Point University, from Purdue, from Georgia Tech, because they're going to be scrappy. Mm. And you come out of Harvard, and I have nothing against Harvard. Harvard's great. We've got a lot of people from Harvard and Stanford and Wharton and you name it. But to come out, unfortunately, feeling uh, entitlement. Mm. Nobody should feel entitlement. Mm. And I'm looking for that student or that person who's hungry. Mm. And if you can teach that here and give them the tools, they'll go a long, long way. One, one, last, one last question of you. Um, I, Henry Carabas, want to do this before my time on earth comes to an end. What would that be? That's a good question. I just want to be, I want to spend as much time as I possibly can with my wonderful wife, Mary Jose. I'm often asked, in, in these kinds of, of uh, interviews, when they get to a lightning round, if you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, who would that be? That's easy, it's my wife. And I mean it, we, we have a great relationship, we have a lot of fun together, uh, we explore the world. You're getting a lot of us in trouble as you speak. I, that's why I'm I saying hope you know that. But that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no free lunch here, you know. Thanks a lot, Henry. <laughs> you, know, you may think just putting my name up out there and up here that that's going to get you someplace. Forget it. 
Um, well, this has been fun. Has it been fun for you? Yes? Um, Thank you. I, um, uh, Bobby, thank you for bringing Henry here. Um, I wish, honestly, Henry, um, I have a regret this afternoon. Every student at Hype University should have been standing around this room listening because the greatest lesson that any one of us could ever have is to know that who you spend time with is who you become. What you choose is what you get. And to your point, how you change is how you succeed. And the more exposure we have, this is why we have in residence 50 people, as I told you, business people, because the more exposed we are to people who have done it, have been there, have learned how to be leaders, Rob, these are, these are the ones who are going to culminate a future for us that is going to be healthy and purposeful for one and all. Um, can I tell you something? I like you. <laughs> I've read a lot about you. I think often we get misrepresented. You know, we read about people, we know people, and, you know, you're a very warm person. You know, do you drink beer? Do I drink beer? Of uh, course. Well, I'll hang out with you someday, and I'll, I'll buy the beer. We can have some fun. Yeah, we can have some fun. You know, it's funny. We might let Bobby come in and be with us, too. I hope so. Um, you but, know, uh, it's funny you say that. So one year... This was after we bought RJR, and for some reason, the Financial Times decided they wanted to name George Roberts and me Men of the Year. So, guy comes in. I wasn't sure I would, did wanted to interview because I don't do, I didn't do much of any of that at the time. And we finished the interview. He said, "You're not anything like I thought you were." Mm. I said, "What'd you think uh, I was? Two heads and horns?" He said, "Close to it." <laughs> and I said, "That's the problem." Yeah, you know. Spend time with people. Yeah. Get to know them. When you get to know somebody, you yeah. appreciate them a lot more. Uh, so I'm getting to know you, and I like you. Well, I'm not taking your job. Don't, don't worry about <laughs> <Okay>. that. <laughs> you're, you're doing too good a job. Andrew Kravis, thank you for being with us. Thank you.